Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. So um, we're going to be looking at three types of persons or people, depending on which type we want, uh, in Proverbs uh, this evening. Uh, and what I wanted to do first was take an overview of that book and then to look at these three types of people. So um, an overview of the book. And I want to mention just before we go any further that obviously I talk about Proverbs. I'm going to be quoting a lot of Proverbs. And if I read out every chapter and verse of every single proverb that I was quoting throughout the talk, we'd probably increase the time by about double. So not all of them are quoted, but hopefully you'll realise when I am quoting a proverb uh, throughout the talk. So Proverbs starts in chapter one. Um, at the start of this book, we are told that these are the Proverbs of Solomon. And what we sometimes do is make a mistake there of thinking that this entire book are all Proverbs of Solomon, which isn't the case. Uh, the fact is that the first verse in chapter 1 is the start of some proverbs which are attributed to Solomon, who does write, indeed, the majority of those proverbs, but, those, but there are proverbs then that are attributed to other people as well. So starting with Solomon, it's not surprising to us, at least, that he wrote so many proverbs. We're told about his ability to produce proverbs back in Kings, which says, he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And we know how clever he was. He was uh, he has wisdom and excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt. So he was exceedingly wise, and he wrote down 3,000 proverbs. And so the proverbs of Solomon, they cover this, these wide range of areas. He begins by speaking about wisdom through chapters 1 to 9, contrasting this with folly and then moves on to a number of practical proverbs between chapters 10 to 22. Then chapter 22, verse 17 onwards, we are introduced to the words of the wise in this chapter. We don't have any further information about the authors, aside from the fact that they were wise. And these are their proverbs, and that they were obviously worth including within this book of proverbs. Then we find further proverbs of Solomon in chapters 25 to 29. And we're told that these were copied down by the scribes of Hezekiah. And then the final chapters of Proverbs, they provide further sayings of the wise. Uh, in chapter 30, we're told that these are the words of Agur, son of Jacob. Agur means the one who is brave in the pursuit of wisdom. So that may not have been his real name. It may have been an attribute given to him, someone who is brave in the pursuit of wisdom, someone who is seeking wisdom. And again, that's the only time in the whole of the Bible that we read about someone called Agur outside of Proverbs. We don't know anything else about him at all. Then chapter 31, verses 1 to 9, we find the Proverbs of King Lemuel, whose name literally translates as belonging to God. But when we start to read that chapter, chapter 31, we realise that these aren't actually his Proverbs. They're actually what were told to him from his mother. It says they were the prophecy that his mother taught him. Or, as it's also translated, an inspired utterance that his mother taught him. So it's clear that these words aren't his proverbs, they're the words from his mother, which he then would have written down. The very first line of the proverbs reaffirms this, which says, What my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. So clearly the mother speaking to her son. Lemuel's mother's sayings apparently contain several Aramaic spellings, which people much more intelligent than me have told me, and you can read about, that these then perhaps point to a non-Israelite background um, within that King Lemuel. So with both Agur and Lemuel, there is a suggestion made by some scholars that these are just another reference to Solomon. Um, but outside of someone suggesting that it could be Solomon, there isn't really much evidence inside or outside of the book to corroborate this. So there could be separate people, could be names for Solomon, a seeker of wisdom. So what appears to have happened is with Proverbs is that it was compiled uh, by somebody or a group of people, potentially the scribes of Hezekiah that we read about in Proverbs, which incorporated the words of Solomon as well as other sayings of the wise people. So I thought before we go any further again, to think for a while about what a proverb is. A good place to start perhaps is by saying what a proverb is not. They are not to be interpreted as prophecies, nor are they statements about effects and then a result. I'll tell you what I mean for this. For example, Proverbs 10.27 says that the years of the wicked are cut short, while the righteous live long and prosperous lives, which is also repeated in other places in Proverbs. 
We're also told that the righteous have abundant food and the wicked will go hungry. So while such statements may generally be true, there are enough exceptions in our life that we encounter to indicate that sometimes the righteous do suffer and the wicked prosper. So these are not absolute true statements. And if we look at where this Hebrew word for proverb comes from, it's commonly translated as proverb, of course, but it's also translated as parable, the same word that Jesus uses to teach. It's translated in the Old Testament as parable 17 times. And Strong's talks about this word carrying with it this sense of superiority of mental action, um, which is interesting as well. And so what we find about most Proverbs are these, these short statements that express a truth about human behaviour. Often there is a repetition of word or sound that helps us to try and remember these words as well. So for most of the book of Proverbs, they're sort of two lines long, they fit into a verse, chapters 10 to 15, almost always express then a contrast between two different types of people, the wise and the foolish, for example. Sometimes the writer makes a simple and general observation. We have such proverbs as, a bribe is a charm to the one who gives it. But usually the writer will then evaluate that conduct. He says, he who hates bribes will live. So many proverbs describe a consequence of a particular action or character trait that people do have. So a wise son brings joy to his father. Since then, the proverbs are written primarily for instruction. Often they are given in the form of commandment. For example, do not love sleep or you will grow poor. And we can see that in practice in real life. The book of Proverbs makes it quite clear in the first seven verses that proverbs are written to give prudence to the simple knowledge and discretion to the young, and to make the wise even wiser. And when we read through the book, you notice there's a frequent reference to this idea of my son, which emphasises the instruction of somebody who is older and wiser, instructing the young, their son, and guiding them in this good way of life. The sons to whom Proverbs is written will acquire the wisdom, as well as know how to avoid the pitfalls of foolishness, that this will lead to a personal well-being, personal well-being, happy family relationships, fruitful endeavours, and a good standing in the community, and more importantly, leading a faithful life with God. That said, although Proverbs is a practical book dealing mainly with how we should live, all of the basis of it comes back to a solid fear of God. And we see that throughout the book, a, re uh, a reverence for God and reliance on him are shown as the path of life, path of prosperity and the path for our security. So this chapter 24, why we, had read it, why we had it read this evening, is in this chapter what became clear to me when I was reading through is that we find three different types of people therein. We find the wicked, we find the foolish and we find the wise. So there are three types of people that I wanted to look at. So finding these three types of people in this chapter I thought well it would be interesting really to see what Proverbs as a whole tells us about these three groups of people, the wicked, the foolish and the wise, and to find out more about them and, and pull all that information together and paint a really clear picture of what it's like to be a fool or someone who is wise or someone who is wicked, and to see how that translates and how we can see those people in our life and how perhaps we also might act as well. So this evening we're going to look at those three types of people, and as we do that, think about your life and think about how you lead your life and Think about other people in your life and how you may see those, those traits and those attributes in yourself or in other people. And what we will see is the wicked people, they are the people that we need to steer clear of because in the main these people are going to hurt or damage us in some way. The foolish people, well we meet these people as well, they're, they're foolish people but we can help these people. And lastly, the wise. These are the people that we need to learn from and that will help us to grow spiritually. These are the people that we want to be around. So if we start with a fool, one of the first things we learn about them is that it, being around a fool tends to reduce our ability to understand, to figure out truth from error, which is why we're told, leave the presence of a fool, or you will not discern the words of knowledge, because we wrap, get wrapped up in what they're saying. Uh, in some Proverbs, we're, we're told to stay out of the way of a fool because they are dangerous. So much to, so that we're told that it's better to meet a bear who has been robbed of her cubs, who's had her, her children taken away, rather than to meet a fool in his folly. 
A fool is so foolish that you wouldn't even employ them or ask them to do something for you because you don't know what the consequences are going to be. We're told that someone who sends a message by the hands of a fool is like somebody who just cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. That is not a good outcome. You don't send a message by a fool. That message isn't going to reach its destination. This is why you do not trust a fool to do anything because they are foolish. And we're told that throughout Proverbs that when we are young, there is often a reference to us being foolish, that we we make mistakes, we do things that we shouldn't do, uh, both in our natural life and in our spiritual life. And when I read that, I wanted to, I started to think really about what what is young? How old is young in the Bible? Where is that that cutoff? You know, I think I'm past young now. I feel like I'm going bald, losing my hair, I've got children, I'm definitely not young anymore. But I wanted to know really where the Bible thought. And looking through it and reading what other people had said about it, there didn't seem to be any clear kind of cutoff for when young ends and old starts. Um, apart from these few things, and we can think about this in discussion later to see if you agree or we've got any other verses that we can, we can look at. Um, in 1 Timothy 5 is an interesting example. And verse 9 talks about when the church should look after and care for a widow. So it says here in this chapter, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, and it then lists a, a list of things that she should be like. And then a few verses later it says, But yet... But let the the younger widow refuse, refuse the younger widow, for when they begin to wax and wanton against Christ, they will marry. So we see that there is an age gap between these two groups and an associated age to clarify who is in which group. Firstly, there are the widows who are threescore years old, so those people over 60. Uh, They should be looked after by the church as they meet the criteria, as long as they meet that criteria listed in in that chapter. Then it says, verse 14, refuse the younger widows. So Paul is saying that the younger widows or women, those, so those people then who are under 60, shouldn't be supported by the churches. They'll probably want to go off and get married, is what he says. So we've got that age divide there. So old widows over 60, young widows under 60. So we've got that young, old. So that's one example of 60 being the, the, the line where we draw young and old in the Bible, which is looking really good for some people in the audience. Perhaps, I don't know. Uh, so, in 2 Samuel, uh, we meet a, chap- a person called Brazili, Brazili, I can't, uh, Brazilii, who we're told is a very aged man. And we're told that he is four score years old. So he is 80 years old and he is called very aged. So he's not just old, he is, you know, really old, very aged, uh, 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 over 80. Which I guess is bad news for some of us in the room. Uh, And the other key passage, which is interesting, is in 1 Kings 12. um, And it's this passage about Rehoboam, where the people, they come to him, they petition him, uh, because they're saying the yoke is too heavy. And verse 6, it says, King Rehoboam, he consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived. So first off, he consults with the old men who stood before Solomon. So these were men who Solomon had around when he reigned. Solomon reigned for 39 years. Uh, it stands to reason then that these men would have been, in the main, probably over 60 years old. If you look at the age of Solomon when he started, the length of his reign. So these men are advising Solomon. So the likelihood is they're going to be over 60. Then we read a bit later, uh, Rehoboam then forsook the counsel of the old men. He wasn't interested in what the old men had to say, um, which they had given him. And he, he consulted with the young men, and this is interesting, which says they were grown up with him and which stood before him. So these young men, they grew up with Rehoboam. So Rehoboam, at this point in time, was 41 years old. This means that the young men that grew up with Rehoboam must have been around about the same age as him, so perhaps in their late 30s to late 40s, otherwise they wouldn't have been able to grow up with him. They'd have been out of that that age bracket. So there, I guess, we're seeing that divide of somewhere around about 60 is, is old and somewhere under 60 is young. But um, aside from that, I couldn't really find any clear definition. I just thought it was quite interesting to look at when you hear what young means in the Bible. Perhaps it will change your interpretation of that and you'll see anyone under 60 is young, anyone over 60 is old, and anyone over 80 very aged. So that's what um, the young are then. So this proverb is written to the young, young. A lot of these are young and you can be foolish when you're young. So if you're under 60, you're young, you can be foolish. So this is a fool. So a fool is like, it can come as no surprise, the fool is foolish. The word literally means foolish, unwise, 
Strong's translates it directly as silly, someone who is silly. Um, and throughout Proverbs, the fool, as we can realise, is the counterpart to the wise. Wisdom is contrasted with folly. The fool does not possess wisdom. The fool cannot obtain wisdom and would not obtain it even if they could. He is completely incapable of grasping wisdom. He just can't get it. We're told that the lips of the righteous feed many, but the fools, they die of lack of understanding. And we read that wisdom is just too high for a fool. The fool can't, can't grasp wisdom. And it says he will not open his mouth in the gate. And when we try and teach a fool, they are not interested in learning. And they're not interested in growing in wisdom. Right at the start of Proverbs, chapter 1-7, we're told that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. They're not interested, they despise it. And people who are fools are unrealistic. They don't see things the way they are. They have a distorted outlook and view on life. In other places in Proverbs, the fool is linked with somebody who is proud, who is haughty, who is a scoffer. And so we see that these people who they, they overestimate their own knowledge, they overestimate their own abilities, they are proud, they are insolent, but when it comes down to it, they don't know anything at all. And I guess we've all encountered people like that in, in our lives as well. I can think of some wonderful examples of people that I've worked with who have all these amazing ideas and could do all these amazing things and you ask them to go and do it and then they don't do anything because actually they completely overestimated their abilities. Um, so when it comes to attaining wisdom, they think it's such a simple thing to do, like buying it from a shop with such little effort. They think that wisdom is something that they can just purchase. And we're asked, why is there a price in the hand of a fool to buy wisdom? Why, why does the, the fool think that he's got some money and that he can just go and buy wisdom? That's not how it works. You need to put some effort in, some work into this. And the fool believes again that his ship is always about to come in, I believe the proverb says. He, not this proverb, the general cultural proverb, sorry about ships coming in. Uh, he's always, the proverb says, looking on the ends of the earth. He's never looking at the reality of life now. He's always looking to the ends of the earth, to the the big payday that's going to come in later on. And we read through Proverbs, we start to see the, the indiscipline of the fool. The fool, he lacks self-control. He acts impulsively without thinking. When it comes to money, we see that the wise are able to retain and to store up their treasure and oil, but, but a foolish man just swallows it up. There is no way for him to control himself. He swallows it up, and what he has, he just spends on what he doesn't need. And does not look after the resources that God has given him. And in contrast to the wise who holds back and is able to control their anger. We have the fool who've, whose wrath is known straight away. The fool is unable to control themselves. We are told that they speak all of their mind. They are like the person who you meet that just can't stop talking. And they keep talking and they keep talking and they kind of get themselves into trouble and they just dig themselves deeper into a pit because they just want to speak all of their mind. They don't know when to be quiet, as the wise person does. And this is the person who, for concealment of their foolishness, would say that they are saying what they see. They are the people that when they get angry, they, they say, well, they can't control it because they like to wear their heart on their sleeve. They're just unable to control their emotions. And because they've got no control, they proclaim their folly to other people. Everyone knows when you meet someone like this. They think they are wise, but they are not, because they are a fool. And Proverbs tells us how to react to a fool. We're told to leave the presence of a fool, or you won't understand and discern the words of knowledge. So what Proverbs is saying is that if we keep the company of fools, we will become foolish and not understand the words of knowledge ourselves, we will start to take on those attributes. And again, we see that in society when charismatic people who make very unwise, foolish decisions, they manage to take on a whole group of people or a whole company, and that company goes under because of one person leading that company who is a fool. And we're told this because the fool is dangerous and harmful and should be avoided, like we said, like a bear robbed of her cubs. And as we've seen before, we're, not, we're told to not waste time speaking to fools because... They despise the words of wisdom, which echo some of the thoughts of Jesus when he spoke about casting our pearls before the swine. And we're told to 
not answer a fool according to his folly. In other words, don't get dragged down to the same level of the fool. Don't try to answer them on their level. Don't respond to them in the same way they're speaking to us. Lift up your conversation with them. We're told to not to give any honour or any weight or any glory at all to the fool. And we're told to discipline the fool with a rod. And all of this, when you read Proverbs, makes you think that fools are completely hopeless. A wasted cause. Don't waste your time on speaking the truth to them because they will never understand. And we get this idea of a babbling fool who, who cannot seem to listen to wisdom, who has no control over themselves. But yet this is the idea that Paul brings to us when he says that we are fools for Christ's sake, but yet we are wise in Christ. And this is sometimes what it's like, and I'm sure that people sometimes look at us and when we're talking about Jesus and what we believe, and they look at us like a babbling fool. It's completely foolish. They can't understand what we're talking about, but yet we know that we are wise and yet they are foolish. But the real fools that we meet, they are not completely a lost cause. Everybody who does not know Jesus is hopelessly lost and foolish apart from divine intervention. And the reason why Proverbs teaches us to try not to reform a fool ourselves is that he must be transformed and that is outside of our own capacity to do. You see, the fool's problem is one of the heart. The heart is not in the right place, so the fool is not in the right place. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The fool's problem is, is that they are leaning on their own understanding so that they are foolish because their heart is not with God. But we are told to keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And Proverbs reminds us that if we would help deliver a fool from his folly, he must be saved from his sin. Rather than working on the symptoms of folly, we must first deal with the heart of the fool. And the solution for the fool is to turn from his folly, from trusting in himself and leaning on himself to fearing and trusting in God. And we have to appreciate that in the eyes of God, we were foolish because we sin. And we still are foolish. We still do foolish things because we don't do the right thing all of the time. And the fact that we sin, therefore, makes us, in a way, a fool at that point in time. We can be proud and trust in ourselves too much. We can get too quickly angry. We can do lots of things that we shouldn't do. And so we are foolish, even though we are trying to trust God with all our heart. And this is why we're told in places like Ephesians 4 to put off the things that are equated with being foolish. In Ephesians 4, it tells us to put off the old man and renew our mind. And Paul tells us to put away lying and anger and stealing and corrupt communication, which are all marks of a fool, and to put on the new man. And so there is hope then, if there's hope for us, there is hope for the fool that we meet. And that we are the ones that can bring that hope. So to help the fool, we must try to tell them and to show them Jesus. Not just trying to inform them by teaching, which will never work on its own. Or trying to reform the fool by rebuke and correction, which also will not work on its own. But we must tell them and show them Jesus. For it is only the gospel which can transform them through the power of what Jesus has done for them. But we need to show the fool Jesus and tell him about Jesus so that he may know him and abandon his own folly. This is the only way, as Jesus says. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So, we looked at the fool, now the wicked. The wicked in Proverbs literally translate as somebody who is morally wrong. The wicked are a very different group of people to the foolish. The foolish have some hope, it appears, that the wicked are perhaps people that generally we need to stay away from and don't have any hope. Proverbs 15 tells us that everything, everything about the wicked is an abomination to God. Much stronger language than that of the fool. It says that the sacrifice of the wicked, the way of the wicked, the way that the wicked person leads their life, even the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. Everything about them, the way they think, the way they live, the way they speak, how they pretend to worship God, are all an abomination. We're told elsewhere that their hearts are, their hearts devise the wicked imaginations, and that their fruit is to sin, and their hearts of evil and of little worth. The wicked are compared to the righteous, 
who are paralleled to them as following God and following God with righteousness, as speaking words which are pure and pleasant, whose prayers are a delight of God, and how the Lord is far from the wicked, but yet hear the prayers of the righteous. And when you start to look at the behaviour of the wicked people, you, you see that it fits into two different areas. The first is violence. We are told that the wicked drink the wine of violence, and that the words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood. The wicked are so cruel that even their mercy is cruel. <clears throat> We're given this parallel of a righteous man regardeth the life of a beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Even their tender mercies are cruel. Even when they're, even when they're thinking that, well, pretending to do something nice, they're cruel. And Psalm 10 gives us a really interesting insight into the lives of the wicked. Again, we're told that violence is one of their characteristics, verse 7 of Psalm 10. His mouth is full of cursing, of deceit, of fraud under his tongue and mischief and vanity. And James wrote, didn't he, about the tongue and how dangerous it can be amongst believers. And so we find that the wicked use their own tongue to incite violence against others. Even the world knows how dangerous speaking violence can be, which is why there are laws against it. And the psalmist goes on and he says that the wicked, they sitteth in the lurking places of the villagers. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. The wicked are dangerous people. They don't care about the people they attack, whether they are good, whether they are bad, or whether they have families depending on them. They don't care. And those who they attack, they are the poor. The wicked use whatever power they have to exploit others. Because the poor are easy victims. They have less ability to protect themselves, which is why Proverbs tells us to open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. <clears throat> what Proverbs is saying is that we need to give a voice to those people who do not have a voice, a voice to the poor and to the needy who are victims of those people who are wicked. And the other main characteristic of the wicked is their arrogance. Proverbs tells us that a naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. And again, a high look and a proud heart, and the ploughing of the wicked is sin. The wicked are arrogant. They are proud and full of their own self-importance, believing that they have achieved everything for themselves. Psalm 10 that we've just looked at tells us that the wicked, in his pride, doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices which they have imagined. The wicked forget that the rich and the poor are both created by God and that we did not make ourselves. They do not realise that everything is from God's hand. Proverbs 22 says, The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. And that has been forgotten by them because in their pride they persecute the poor, often perhaps thinking that that's not even a problem for them to do. And what the wicked do is view themselves as self-made, and in their arrogance, they think that God will never do anything to them. They have nothing but contempt for God. They laugh at any idea of his judgment. And the fact is that they do not worship God, they worship themselves. In that 10th Psalm, again, it says, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desires, and blesseth the covetousness whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. So the wicked, they are proud of their heart's desires, of their sinful heart's desires. Notice that just like the fool, the heart of the wicked is wrong. The heart is where it's going wrong. The wicked are so proud of their desires that they boast about them. And you hear it nowadays that people boast about their desires, how they want to be rich, how they want to be famous, how they want to do all these things. They're boasting about their own heart's desires and they don't see a problem with that. And their arrogance and their pride turn their heart away from God. And we may have grown up knowing the Bible, you may have ended up, but you have ended up, these people have ended up living for themselves, deciding what to do in life by what they view as important, by what they view as important to achieve. But Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But, Proverbs says, there is a future for the wicked. And it tells us to fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious of the wicked. For the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. 
So it might be that the wicked announce that there is no God. It might be that the wicked seem to have free reign to do violence in the world, fuelled by their own arrogance and pride. But they have mistaken God's silence for inaction. God is not forgetful. God is not negligent. Instead, he is patient and kind with sinners, giving them every single opportunity to turn away from their sin and repent. God's kindness and patience is meant to lead them to repentance and back to him. And that is the only hope for the wicked. So then we have the wise. And this is who we need to be like. This is who we can really learn from. <coughs> Real wisdom is the most valuable gift that a parent can pass on to their children. Which is why there's so many references to Proverbs being written to the son. Passing that wisdom on to the next generation. And wisdom encompasses not only what we know, but also what we do. And sometimes what we don't do. And as we think about the wise, we need to think about what we are like and how many things of a wise person do we do in our lives. Well, firstly, we read about the wise being restrained. Proverbs frequently shows the righteous and the wise as cautious when they talk. And sometimes they simply say nothing, as it is written, that he that refraineth his lips is wise. So sometimes they don't speak, sometimes they hold back. But when they do speak, they speak gently but powerfully. Even when someone is angry with them, they don't respond with anger to anger. They speak kindly and gently. The kind of person who is sensible enough to stop before an argument starts. Their patience controls their conflict. If an issue with a neighbour, for example, does arise, what the wise person will do is speak directly to that offending party <coughs> instead of going around criticising and gossiping about them to other people. We're told to debate thy cause with thy neighbour himself and discover not a secret to another. Don't go and tell the secrets of what's been going on to other people. Go and speak to your neighbour about the problem that you have with them. And like the fool who always wants to be right, the wise, they accept rebuke. They confess their wrong and repent from their sin. And instead of insisting that their own ideas about how life and relationships work, these are the ones who have turned to wisdom. That they have listened to their parents, they have submitted to God's will, even when that submission was painful. And one of the key things that the wise do is to put themselves in the company of those people who are wiser than they are. You see, if you are wise, you will know that you are never wise enough and that there is always something new to learn and in a different way that you may grow. And by seeking the company of those who are wiser than you, then you will receive some guidance and instruction. And if you want to be around somebody, then you need to be around them and talk with them. As Proverbs 13 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So if you, are wise, if you want to be wise, you go to wise people, and they are the group of people that you associate the most with. So when we think about ourselves and how we are striving to be wise, we need to think about how ready we are to accept criticism and to admit correction. Are we ready to listen to advice from those who are wiser than us? Whose company do we seek? Who are our friends? Who do we go to for help and advice? Are we asking the right people? Are we asking people who are wise? Do we manage to overlook insults and stay calm? Or do we respond to them and let them affect us? Are we thinking about what we're saying before we answer? And when we do speak, is our speech bringing healing? Or is it inflaming the situation that we're speaking into? Are we careful with the friends that we keep and that the things that we do... Are we doing them so we remain diligent and disciplined in following Jesus? And speaking of Jesus, we are reminded that all of the Bible and Proverbs looks forward to him. And Jesus fulfills the book of Proverbs. He was the wisest of men. And we know that Jesus was a man of wisdom during his ministry. We know that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. And that we know that his primary teaching message was a parable or a proverb. So Jesus was wise, Jesus was a teacher of wisdom, Jesus gave his disciples wisdom. He says to them, I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And the teachings of Jesus mirror the contrast that we have seen in Proverbs, the two different paths our life can take. The paths of wisdom or the path of foolishness. And what the New Testament teaches is the choice between salvation and wisdom and foolishness and death. Paul in Romans talks of people who 
were not thankful to God, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. They chose other things to put above God. They chose things that were created by God and put them above God, and in that sense they were foolish. Because we need to be putting God at the centre of our lives as the most important thing, not putting anything else above him, and that is the only wise choice to do. Because foolishness will lead to, lead to our death, but wisdom will lead to our salvation. So a summary then this evening, we've taken a brief look at what we can learn from Proverbs. We've thought about the, the young, the old and the very old, or aged. We've looked at three types of people, the foolish, the wicked and the wise. Hopefully we've seen some elements of these people, hopefully more in the wise and less so in the foolish and the wicked in each of ourselves and other people that we may know. And then we thought of Jesus and how he fulfills problems. We recognise that Jesus is the wise man. And when we recognise that, we may find a greater need to look back at the book of Proverbs and to live our life the way that Proverbs outlines. Because we know that when we live wisely according to Proverbs, we are in fact living the life that Jesus lived. And we will slowly start to be conformed into his image and reflect his glory into the world around us.